For me, it's a great privilege to introduce John. 20 years ago, I read his book, and I wished one day, if I could only sit at the feet of this gentleman and listen to what he has to say. So everyone, please give a big hand to Professor John Shaw Taylor, <laughs> who's joining us from London. Thank you, John. And I'm also the director of that center. And one of the things we're establishing is an, uh, a global network of excellence somewhat modeled on the Pascal network that uh, Ulrich referred to, but the, it's called Nexus, which is standing for a network on artificial intelligence and knowledge for sustainable development. Okay, so uh, I'll dive in, um, and I'm going to be giving three lectures. So uh, I'm just going to give you first an overview of the first lecture, which um, I guess I start... I mean, you, you'll tell me when to finish, right? Um, okay, so we'll keep track of time. Um, so I'm going to, sorry, the overview, I'm going to give a, a, a simple worked example of uh, pri primal ridge regression first, but then that will lead to understand how kernels play a role. Um, sorry, it's a bit, maybe just a little loud, yeah. Okay, that's great. Uh, and it will segue into the uh, idea of using this dual representation uh, and thereby moving to uh, kernel methods and uh, some of the ideas that then we'll be picking up in the second lecture in looking at support vector machines and some of the ways we can translate the theoretical analysis into uh, an optimization for machine learning. Um, so I think the theme of this first lecture is the expressivity versus generalization. Um, and the question of what is the right level of expressivity if we want to try to ensure good performance on test data, which is the, 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 the idea of generalization. So I'm going to start with this simple example. I'll use it to highlight some of the different uh, <coughs> factors influencing performance uh, and so the design of machine learning applications generally. And the key issues is this trade-off between expressivity and generalization. Um, and that will lead to highlighting some of the properties of kernels. Um, so as I say, I'll start with this worked example. And also, it'll be a way of sort of settling the notation. So um, I'm thinking of, in this case, uh, linear functions. So I can write that either in this uh, angle bracket notation or uh, x prime. I'm thinking of. Uh, vectors written as uh, column vectors, and then the prime is the transpose, so this is a, a 1 by uh, n vector times an n by 1 vector, so this just becomes a matrix multiplication. Uh, it's an equivalent way of writing this, or you can write it explicitly as a weighted sum, sum from 1 to n of wi, xi. We think of um, being given uh, a set of training data, which I'm going to denote always with s, uh, which is a set of data. Um, M is my standard notation for the number of training examples. Um, bold X is the e vector, and the lowercase is a, a scalar, so this is an input vector with an output, uh, real-valued output Y1, up to XM with output YN. Okay. Um, so I'm thinking of this as in, uh, embedded in an n-dimensional input space with, as I said, the outputs uh, being here real values. Um, we're thinking of trying to learn a function, and we think of it as a pattern, a pattern function, and uh, we're using some measure of performance or discrepancy in this case between the output and the correct output, and in this case it's the very standard uh, squared difference. Um, which obviously is going to be zero if we get it exactly right and uh, will measure some degree of mismatch. Um, and uh, though the, we're thinking of these functions as being linear, this measure is now quadratic in, in the function. Uh, we create, again, notation, a vector psi, which is the uh, difference between the output vector now a vector over the examples, so an m-dimensional vector. And this is the set of, uh, this is the target, and these are the outputs of the function on the uh, 
inputs. So the inputs now are the rows of x. Uh, first row is going to be the first input, second row uh, the second input, and so on. So when we multiply that matrix by the weight vector w, we get the row, the, the column vector of the outputs generated by the linear function. We subtract that from the target, and we have this discrepancy vector psi. Uh, so again, just syncing the notation. I'm sure you're me uh, familiar with much of this, um, but it's to make sure we're all on the same page. Uh, so then we have an optimization in which we would like to find the weight that will do a good job. And we think of that as minimizing this discrepancy vector, psi squared, the norm of, uh, sorry, the norm of psi squared. And we add in this uh, control of the flexibility of that uh, function, which is defined by the weight vector, by adding in a, multiply, uh, a, a multiple of the norm squared of the weight vector. And the, multiple, uh, the factor is known as the regularization parameter, denoted by lambda. Um, so that is the thing we try to optimize. And we're trading here, in some sense, expressivity, because of the uh, norm of the weight vector, and accuracy on the training data, which is represented by that psi, uh, psi vector. <clears throat> OK, so if we just multiply out the um, psi vector, we uh, take the inner product of this uh, discrepancy vector by itself, multiply out the terms, and we arrive at this, uh, add in the lambda times w squared, and then take the derivative of this objective in order to set that equal to 0, and hence find the optimal solution. We end up with this equation here. <coughs> So uh, it's really quite straightforward, but uh, you can see the derivative of this will be, I, I, there's a factor 2, which I've just canceled through. Uh, it would be twice x prime to xw plus uh, twice lambda w. Uh, and this factor, the 2, is already there. Uh, and it's x prime y. And we just move the other to the other side, and we have uh, that equation, uh, which is now just a system of linear equations. We can solve it for w or write out the solution by just multiplying by the inverse of this uh, matrix here. Um, and we get the form of the solution. w is this matrix inverse times x prime y. And so <clears throat> the function that we've learned has this form. If we want to evaluate it on a test point, we <coughs> take the test point uh, transpose times w, and w is equal to this. And so this is the evaluation on a test point. Um, <clears throat> so just a few comments on the regularization parameter lambda. As lambda goes to 0, we end up <coughs> with uh, least squares regression. Um, but of course, this matrix x primed x may not be invertible. Of course, <coughs> the way we've written, by adding in the lambda, we guarantee it will be, because this is a positive semi-definite matrix. We add the lambda, it's going to have positive uh, eigenvalues, and so it will be invertible. Um, but the stability of that will depend on the size of lambda. And as lambda tends towards zero, uh, we may uh, run into instability. Um, the way that's solved in classical um, least squares regression is to uh, use what's called the pseudo-inverse, which is a sort of partial regularization. You basically ignore the dimensions in which the eigenvalues are zero or very small, um, and only invert in the other dimensions. Um, <clears throat> but the non-lambda, uh, sorry, the non-zero lambda is uh, a quite nice way of avoiding that problem. Um, if the dimension of the feature space is small, of course, then compared to the amount of training data, then it's likely to be invertible if the points cover you know, the, the full dimensionality. But for large dimensional feature spaces, uh, this may be unstable. Um, and so increasing lambda makes it more stable, but at the uh, expense of being uh, a bit damped, the solution. OK, so what are the implications for the design of ML systems? Um, if the feature space is too simple, we may not be able to represent the function we want to learn. So we will do poorly on the training data. Um, 
And this is referred to as underfitting. Uh, so we're simply not able to m find or, or, or represent the function that we need to learn. Um, but if we create more complex features, we may create uh, unstable learning. Um, and so the solution becomes dependent on the particular choice of training set. So choose another training set, you may get a different uh, uh, result. And so in some sense, we're, we're not learning the underlying function. We're sort of learning some chance uh, perturbation of that function. Uh, in that sense, it becomes unstable. And so regularization is the way of potentially mitigating this danger. Um, but is there something more general way of making more complex feature spaces while enabling good generalization? Okay, so that's sort of the motivation, as it were, for introducing this idea of the kernel approach. <clears throat> and uh, so I'm now going to work through that same example and show how you can reach a kernel version of the ridge regression algorithm. And it starts very simply by looking at the solution we had from the primal version uh, and the corresponding regression function. Um, and what we can, if we just take that formula, which is the formula we got from solving the primal ridge regression, and express this here, W, in terms of the other components. So I've moved this x primed x w here to the other side and divided through by lambda. I get this expression. And then I can pull out, if you see both of these terms start with x primed, so I can pull out the x primed and uh, I actually have w written as an expression uh, of x prime times some vector here alpha, I'm going to call it. So alpha is equal to this vector here. Um, and although, you know, alpha also involves w, this demonstrates that when this equation holds, w can be expressed in this form of x prime times a vector. And what that means is, now remember, x was the matrix with the rows were the training examples. So x primed is the matrix with the columns as the training examples. And if we multiply that by uh, vector alpha, what we're essentially doing is taking a weighted sum of the columns. So we're writing W as a weighted sum of the columns of, uh, X, pri of X primed, <clears throat> which says it's just a weighted sum of the training inputs. So we can actually write W in this form, alpha, sum alpha i xi, where xi was the ith training input from the training set. So this is a key observation that the actual solution can be expressed as a, a weighted sum of the training examples. Okay, now then this suggests, oh, right, okay, well let's not try and learn W, let's try and learn this alpha, this way of cr creating W from the training examples. So I'm now going to try and find an equation for alpha rather than an equation for w. Okay. So just a, a, a different way of reaching w. So it's the same w, it's just a way of expressing it is differently. Uh, so how can we do that? Well, um, we've already got a, a formula here for, uh, for w in terms of x. Uh, sorry, we've already got this formula for alpha here. Uh, but it involves W. All we need to do is to substitute in here for W um, in terms of alpha. So we just put in X primed alpha, which is what uh, the way of expressing W, into this equation here. And we arrive at this equation. Uh, I've just multiplied through by lambda. So at lambda alpha equals Y minus X, X primed alpha. And if we bring the terms in alpha to the same side, we get this uh, equation which is actually even simpler than the primal equation. <clears throat> if you remember, the primal equation had an x prime y on the, on the right-hand side, and in this case, the x primes disappeared. And we've actually got alpha now as this equation, inverse times y. <clears throat> and the difference from the previous one, the previous one had x primed x, and this has x x primed. It's expressed in this way, where I've now written uh, x x primed, this matrix of inner products as K, which is sort of suggestive that it might be a kernel matrix. 
<coughs> and the, uh, as I said, the i jth entry is just the inner product between the ith and jth input examples. And uh, the evaluation on the test point is given by this uh, expression here, where we've got a weighted sum of the inner products between x and the inner training, ith training example. And the important observation here is that the input data enters both of these equations only through inner product evaluations between input examples. So in this case, it enters into this matrix K, and K, as I said, is just a set of inner products. And in this case, in the test case, it enters in this weighted sum, where again, it's only coming in through inner products uh, between, in this case, a test point and one of the training points. So this means we can apply the kernel trick. And the kernel trick is replacing those inner products <coughs> with a kernel function, uh, which is evaluating an inner product in a more complicated space, potentially. So we imagine that we project our input data into a more a richer space uh, with a projection function phi, uh, but we are able to evaluate that uh, inner product in that more expressive space through a so-called shortcut function, this kernel function, which actually uh, evaluates that uh, the inner product between the projections of those two data points into that more richer space. <clears throat> so if we're able to do that, so that's an if, then we substitute in the previous uh, expressions here, wherever we had an inner product, we just substitute that kernel function and then we will be effectively running our algorithm in that high, richer, higher dimensional space um, represented by the phi function, the, the, the projection function into that higher space, even though the thing we're actually doing is exactly the same uh, uh, equation as we had before, simply that now instead of the inner product evaluation, we're using a kernel function here. So this is the trick that allows us to run the algorithm in a, in a rich space at no extra cost. Well, uh, potentially extra cost is just evaluating this uh, kernel function. And to sort of justify that that, uh, of course, if we use the identity function here, then we're back into a primal, uh, the equivalent exactly of the primal. Um, so the standard in a product in that case, and we'd be solving the same, exactly the same problem as we were in the primal space but just through this dual representation. Um, but if we use, obviously, a richer kernel function, then we'll be using, uh, potentially getting a solution in a richer space. Um, and uh, as an example to prove this can happen, here's perhaps the simplest uh, uh, non-trivial kernel function is the so-called quadratic kernel. And, uh, all we do is take the normal inner product, and so that's you know, a real number, and then we just square that real number. So there's one extra computation we perform at the end of this uh, inner product evaluation. We just square the result. Um, and that actually corresponds to the following uh, feature space. Um, we can just manipulate this x prime z squared uh, by just swapping the order of one of those uh, inner products here, and uh, that uh, gives us z primed times xx prime z, and that actually is an inner product between the vectorized version of zz primed and the vectorized version of xx prime. Now, zz prime, remember, z was a column vector times a row vector, so when you multiply those two together, you get a full matrix where the individual components are just the ith component of uh, z times the jth component of z, uh, and the equivalent, of course, on, with the other would be the uh, ith component of x times the jth component of, of x. So these are now, if this was an n-dimensional vector, this will be an n-squared dimensional vector. And so we've uh, actually computing a product, uh, sorry, an inner product in that n-squared dimensional space. Um, and so we're actually, we're actually working in a, where we might have had an n-dimensional input vector, we're now looking at an n-squared dimensional 
feature space, uh, and we're computing inner products in that space with that one extra computation, just squaring the result of the standard inner product. Um, so this demonstrates, I think, very clearly how you can actually get a, a huge kind of increase in complexity, potentially, in your representation by adding in a relatively uh, simple uh, additional compu computation in the kernel function. So just to sort of work through the implications of that on a simple example, imagine we're doing, um, we've got a thousand images represented uh, by pixel vectors, and maybe they're 32 by 32 um, uh, size pixels, so they have 1,024 pixels. So in our primal version, um, we would have 1,024 by 1,024 dimensional matrix that we would be inverting. Remember, that's the, the dimension of the input is 1,024. So that's the size of the matrix. But in the, if we use the quadratic kernel, we're actually in a, something like in a million dimensional space. Um, but the actual computation of in the learning phase is, is less because we're just inverting a thousand by a thousand uh, dimensional matrix. That's the size of the training data. So a thousand by a thousand. So we're actually doing less work in the initial phase of the, um, of the learning at the expense, of course, of extra work in the evaluation phase because there we need to work out the inner products with the test point with each of the training points. So we have uh, a thousand times more, as it were, work to perform to do uh, an, an evaluation. Um, but nonetheless, that's, uh, you might say, you know, not, not such a cost, but it, it, it is a cost in this case. But uh, we're actually running that algorithm now in a much richer space. Okay, so I think uh, hopefully I've motivated the, the approach. The key thing was to transform our algorithm, in this case, a regression, linear least squares regression algorithm with a regularization uh, parameter um, based on the two norm of the weight vector. I've converted that into a form in which it only involves inner products. And then I've made the observation, aha, okay, now we can use this trick of substituting in uh, a, an alternative inner product function um, that allows us to effectively be working in this high dimensional space. The question now is, when can we do that? What are the functions that are okay for us to perform that? And how can we think about generating them? So um, it certainly, it, sorry, this is just going back to what I said. It allows us to form linear regression in a very high dimensional space. Um, and this is sort of a, a separate observation. Sorry, I'll come back to what I was saying in a moment ago. I forgot I have this slide. Um, what, is the, what are we effectively doing? We're effectively performing nonlinear regression in the original input space. So in the case of the quadratic kernel, what we end up is with a function of this form which is actually now a weighted combination of quadratic terms, these inner products with the square added. Um, so we're doing a quadratic polynomial function of the components of the input x. Um, and of course, moving to this very high dimensional space, we have that danger that I mentioned in the introduction, which was, yeah, okay, we're gonna get a lot more expressivity. Are we are in danger now of uh, sort of being unstable in that we have this very uh, high dimensional and therefore very flexible space. Um, and so are we going to suffer from the so-called curse of dimensionality? And we'll come back to how that can be addressed in, uh, in, in the second lecture. Um, but what I want to do now is, uh, as I mentioned, was just talk more generally about kernel, uh, kernel approach and what are the conditions for a a function to be a kernel function, uh, and therefore how we can start to manipulate these kernels to generate the kernels that will be useful for different applications. So the data is embedded in a Euclidean feature space, um, and then linear relations are sought uh, among the images of the data, uh, and the algorithms are implemented so that they only require inner products between the uh, vectors, and then we substitute the kernel for that inner product. Um, 
the embedded, embedding designed so that the inner products of images of two points can potentially be computed directly with this so-called shortcut kernel function. So one way of thinking of this, it's very difficult to imagine because we don't, we're not good at imagining um, anything beyond three dimensions. Um, so what we're potentially doing here is, you know, going up to, a, in, in the case I gave, a million dimensions. So it's, uh, you know, our intuitions are not usually uh, very good at this. Um, and uh, actually, I was once trying to explain an algorithm to um, a senior member of the uh, machine learning community at, at one conference. And, you know, I'd been going for a while. And I didn't seem to be getting very far. And then he kind of turned around to me and he said, I think you have a very low dimensional intuition, <laughs> which is, I think, very true, and I think it's still true to this day. But, um, uh, and I think he's probably right that what I was explaining didn't work. But what the intuition is here is that somehow in this higher dimensional space, we will be able to find a linear function that will do the job for us, okay? And in this case, this is a, a, a classification problem. We're trying to separate the crosses from the zeros, and in the input space, there's no linear function that will separate them, but by pushing them into, obviously in this case it's the same dimension, but imagine a higher dimensional space, we create a situation where they can be separated um, by a linear function. So what are the properties of kernels? So first property is, uh, kernel function, sorry, uh, first property is that they're uh, symmetric, so if we swap the order of the inputs, uh, we should get the same result. Um, and that's clearly just uh, follows from the property of the inner product. Uh, but there's a more complex property that is critical, and that's the so-called positive semi-definite property. Um, and this requires that any kernel matrix that we construct from this function, so we're given the function, give any set of inputs, uh, don't worry about the outputs now, just a set of input vectors uh, in the input space. Create the kernel matrix. Remember, that was the matrix of all inner products. Uh, the ij entry was the inner product between the ith input and the jth input. And uh, then take uh, any vector u, uh, and if we take this uh, u prime ku, which is just a weighted you know, sum of these uh, inner products, we can see that by moving the sum inside the inner product uh, of the uh, UIs and UJs, we actually end up with this being the norm squared of the weighted combination of the uh, projection vectors. And of course, if this is a kernel function, that will correspond to a vector in the feature space, in the, in the high dimensional feature space. And this will therefore correspond to the norm squared of that uh, vector, and hence must be non-negative. So this property is actually telling us that this kernel matrix has no negative eigenvalues, is another way of expressing it. So it's a positive semi-definite matrix. And so what we require of the kernel function is that any kernel matrix we construct from it will be positive semi-definite. If it's not, then clearly there's a, a breakdown of this property that we require uh, that it actually represents a vector uh, in this kernel-defined feature space. So those are two properties. It turns out that that's, those two are the only two critical properties. Uh, so any function that satisfies those two properties is actually, there are some technical mathematical ones that I'm going to skip, but they're not really very important. These are the only two critical properties that we require in order for a function to be uh, actually representing the kernel computation in a feature space. So whereas before we were thinking perhaps, okay, we're gonna create this complex feature space and then think about how to compute in a product sufficiently in that space through this, you know, constructing a kernel function, another way of going about it is say, okay, let's find a function that satisfies these two properties then it will be a kernel function for some feature space. Um, and uh, just to justify, I won't go through the detail, but I'll sketch the uh, 
the way in which we can actually do an explicit construction of that feature space, just to give you a, a sense of how it's done. Um, and uh, so this uh, is, uh, I'm just summarizing here uh, the points I made about the eigenvalues being non-negative and so on. So this is the way in which we can construct that feature space. So it's just to give you a feeling um, of how it's done. So the, the way it's done is actually construct the feature space as a set of functions. So the points in the feature space are functions. Now that sounds a little, well, why do you want to do that? But actually it's not illogical. Since this feature space is going to be um, a um, so-called Hilbert space, going to be an inner product space, going to have inner products, um, essentially points are functions because you can think of when you have a point, you can use the inner product with that point to define a function on the space. Uh, so it's not completely illogical to think of actually setting up the space by defining it, the points as functions. But it turns, I mean, it just turns out to be mathematically very straightforward to do that. Uh, so this is the space of functions that we are now thinking of as the points in, of, this is the feature space. Um, and the functions are just constructed by taking uh, linear combinations of the kernel uh, at particular input points and then leaving blank the second argument. So now this is a function by uh, filling in the second argument. So this, you know, maps a point X to this sum with X substituted into this second component here. So that is the way it is a function. Um, and so these are now the points, okay? Sorry if this is getting a little confusing, but uh, hopefully you'll see when it we put it all together that this is a sensible way to do things. It certainly is a linear space. You can take two points uh, and add them together. There's a, there's a zero, uh, which is just the zero function. Add two of these together, you get another in the same form. Um, so it's a linear space. Uh, we actually have the embedding function given to us. We map the input x with the phi function to this function, which is in this space. It's just the very simplest uh, type of function where alpha is just a single uh, point uh, in the input space and alpha i is equal to one. Um, and so that's, that's a way of embedding. Remember, we need that function phi to embed. Um, we need to define inner products. Well, they're defined in the following way. If we have two functions, fx here and gx here in the space, the inner product between f and g is just defined in this way um, uh, as just combining the two. And of course, the inner product now is in a, uh, a weighted combination of these kernel evaluations. Uh, and it turns out to be well defined. And so that actually constructs the space for us together with the uh, projection mapping into that space. Um, and because of the positive semi-definite property, which is critical, of course, this actually in a product which we would require to be uh, non-negative is indeed non-negative. Uh, and so it's, it's, uh, it is actually uh, an inner product space. Um, it also has some nice properties. There's this uh, so-called reproducing property where if we take the inner product between a function and the projection of an input uh, x0 into the space through the phi uh, mapping, that actually, phi mapping, of course, was just the uh, kernel function uh, evaluated at first argument x0. And if you remember, the inner product between f and this, which was defined um, here, um, actually turns out to be f of x0. So it's an evaluation. So it actually, the inner product between the projection into the space and the function is actually the evaluation of the function at that point, which again makes sense. It's just the inner product in that space and that's exactly how functions are defined in that space by taking the inner product with that point. Um, and this implies that the inner product corresponds to function evaluation and learning a function corresponds to learning a point being the weight vector corresponding to that function. So we're actually learning a point in that feature space that would be the generating the correct inner products. It also has some nice 
further properties because we can actually then think of um, if we have a distribution on the input space, we can, uh, there is a point in the feature space that represents that distribution and that is so-called the mean embedding. And what we do here is take the average of the embedding of the uh, input points, again, weighted according to that input distribution. So this is the mean embedding. So you imagine taking the embedding of all the input spaces, input points, and then averaging them with the, uh, with the input distribution. And if we do that, we can uh, evaluate uh, expectations of a function evaluation. So imagine we wanted to evaluate the expected evaluation of the function f of x. Uh, so that's just, remember, f of x is just an inner product between some weight vector which represents that function and the projection of the input phi of x. Uh, the expectation of that, we can take the expectation inside the inner product and that now is the in, the mean embedding, which is just what I defined up here, of, the, uh, of that distribution. Uh, so we just can evaluate a, uh, an expectation of the function evaluation by just taking the inner product with that mean embedding. So a very nice property that I will mention again, hopefully if I have time at the end, uh, in a reinforcement learning application. Uh, but uh, I think these are um, a kind of properties that give us a lot of flexibility in the way we think about uh, kernels and the way in which we manipulate the feature space defined by kernels. Um, I mean, this sort of is closely related to the characteristic function of a distribution, if you're familiar with uh, that kind of concept. If we have a rich uh, kernel, this can actually be a unique, that uniquely defines the distribution um, that point in the, in the feature space in the way that a characteristic function of a distribution defines the distribution. Okay, so I think um, I've got a little bit more time, have I, for this first lecture? Or how are we doing? Yeah, okay. We might take a short break after this and then, you know, come back just to give people a little bit. Okay, so just really um, now following on, these are just sort of consequences of thinking about this kernel construction um, that we can create to make new kernels from old kernels. So if we have two valid kernels, then we can just add them together and create a new kernel. And this would just correspond to actually concatenating the two feature vectors corresponding to the two kernels. So if we take the feature vector corresponding to kernel kappa one and the feature vector corresponding, sorry, feature projection corresponding to kernel kappa two, concatenate them, obviously the inner product between those now two projections into that feature space would correspond to the inner product between the phi one, the first projection, which can be evaluated with kappa one, and the uh, adding to the inner product between phi uh, two uh, projections of the two inputs, uh, which corresponds to kappa two. So we can actually create this new feature space by just adding the two kernels. Uh, more. Uh, Obviously, multiplying by a constant, positive constant, will be um, a, a new kernel. Um, uh, more interestingly, if we uh, take the product of two kernels, we actually get a kernel. Um, and this actually uh, corresponds to um, a bit like the quadratic kernel. Remember, the quadratic kernel is just the product of uh, the uh, inner product with itself. Um, so if you imagine that kappa one and kappa two are both the inner product, this would just correspond to the, the quadratic kernel. If you remember what I said there was that the features correspond to, the new features are all of the different ways you can take one feature from, uh, uh, two, one feature from the first kernel and another feature from the second kernel and multiply them together and create a new feature. And so in the case of the, um, the quadratic kernel, we had n features uh, and we just took uh, pairs of those. So we had n squared features created. Here, exactly the same thing would occur if we had n1 features for ca kernel kappa 1 and n2 features for kernel kappa 2, we'd have n1 times n2 features here in which each of the 
features would correspond to a product between one of the features from the first kernel and one of the features from the second kernel. Um, so that's the way, it's so something called the tensor product of the two feature vectors. Um, so uh, this is a, a simpler, if we take any function fx, we can just uh, do this uh, example. And this would correspond actually to the product kernel between the kappa 1 and the kernel which has a single feature fx. And so fx, you know, one dimensional feature space fx times fz would then correspond to the inner product in that space. Of course, we can apply a, a, a sequence of kernels if we had a projection phi x and apply a kernel in that space. We could uh, create a new kernel. Um, this one is, if we have a positive, this has to be a positive semi matrix, we can kind of morph the input space in some way uh, in order to give emphasis to different uh, dimensions. Uh, so that creates a new kernel. This is the so-called normalized kernel where we can actually uh, divide by the square root of the kernel evaluator uh, on the same input um, xx and zz, and that ensures that the kernel uh, evaluation of x with itself is equal to 1 for all x. So it's a so-called normalized kernel, but it is a kernel. Um, and so we can also think about a polynomial function of kernel uh, of, of a kernel, provided that the uh, coefficients of the polynomial are positive. So the quadratic kernel was just the simplest example of that, but you can generalize that to higher dimension, higher um, degree polynomials. Uh, but the positive coefficients is, is critical. So the exponential function, of course, can be expressed as a, uh, uh, a polynomial, uh, an infinite polynomial with positive coefficients. So again, the exponential function of a kernel is also a kernel. And if we normalize the exponential, this kernel, we end up with the so-called Gaussian kernel, um, which is a very popular kernel. Um, and it's called Gaussian because it sort of looks a bit like a Gaussian distribution, but without the normalizing factor, but actually, you know, has no real connection. But it is a kernel, and the, this is a very simple proof showing that by normalizing this kernel, we end up with this uh, expression here. I think the Gaussian kernel is quite interesting because it's a way of thinking of reducing to the minimum your assumptions about the data. So all we're assuming here is that if two inputs are close together, then they will have similar outputs. Uh, and closeness is also defined in terms of this uh, sigma here, which is sort of the scaling, if you like, of the degree of similarity. So if they're sort of d distant sigma apart, then they should have similar output. But if they're further apart, then all bets are off. So you're being very kind of unprescriptive, very general in terms of the way in which you expect the uh, inputs to or the inputs to sort of align in terms of their outputs. So you're being very, uh, what I would call, um, unrestrictive in the way you think about that, um, which is in one way very good. It gives you a very flexible, but of course, you, you know, um, the more you can say, the more background knowledge you can bring about your data inputs, to the uh, learning algorithm through the kernel, the better you will be able to learn or be able to learn as well with less data. So I will be talking in the next lecture about ways in which we can understand how the kernel is creating some prior, under, prior distribution or prior over the functions that it will like to represent. Uh, and this is, I think, the, the Bayesian perspective on kernel functions that I think is very valuable in terms of understanding what's going on. Um, so I think uh, just a quick historical reference and then we'll take a break and I'll come back and talk about that other aspects then. So um, kernel methods were introduced in the 90s with the support vector machines, uh, which I will talk about in, in more detail. Um, and the statistical analysis showing large margin 
uh, can overcome the curse of dimensionality, which I'll also mention. And extensions then rapidly were introduced for other uh, tasks other than classification. Kernel ridge regression presented above was just one example. Excellent. Okay, so let's take a five-minute break just to stretch, and we'll move into the support vector machine uh, topics next. Thank you. Okay, so um, what I wanted to do in this second lecture is try to motivate that how are we going to choose our optimization in some sense? Okay, so we understand we've got this kernel-defined feature space. That's great. Um, but what is it? How are we going to convert what we really want to achieve, which is performance on test data, into the algorithm that we're actually going to uh, apply and what that will translate to in terms of optimization. So in the example I gave of ridge regression, to some extent that was given to us because we know about least squares regression, so we just used that and there was this, okay, let's keep it controlled by uh, some control of the size of the weight vector. Um, that was a bit ad hoc in some sense. Uh, it, it works pretty well. Um, but there was also another slight down of that particular optimization in that, uh, as I showed in the example, at the end, when you're evaluating a test point, you had to evaluate inner products with all of the training data uh, because of that weighted sum, some alpha i, x, i, inner product x. Um, and that actually creates uh, an overhead. So if we can find a way of optimizing that will actually reduce the number of non-zero alphas, in other words, the evaluation of inner products will therefore not be required, that would also be uh, a benefit. So um, I'm going to take a slight detour into some general statistical considerations uh, and some of the issues around expected versus high confidence bounds. Um, and mention Radamaka analysis. I'm not going to go deeply into this at all, but I just want to get a kind of framework within which we can see the optimization of the performance that we're going to implement that will lead to the uh, support vector machine. Um, so that will be the support vector machine optimization uh, that optimizes the, the Radamaka bound, and then uh, the distribution of errors that that results in uh, and, of course, the dual form of, you know, using a kernel in that case. Okay, so uh, this is just, as I say, a slight detour from kernel methods per se, but it's to try to set the scene in how we define the optimization. So we're translating the results of statistical learning theory into an algorithm, um, and that will enable a much tighter control on the uh, use of complexity to deliver good performance uh, on the test set. So the critical question is how do you, you know, trade this expressivity and control of expressivity in order to deliver good performance? Um, so in that sense, it can also provide a principled approach to designing machine learning strategies. Um, and, you know, something that a philosophy that should, I believe, inform all machine learning design, not just kernel methods. Okay, so general statistical considerations. So from the point of view of uh, statistical learning theory, um, we want to model this phenomenon, learning, uh, in a way that will enable us to better understand and exploit uh, the approach. Uh, so statistical learning theory, I should say, is just one uh, way of doing this. I will also be talking a bit, as I mentioned before, about Bayesian inference, which is an alternative uh, with different assumptions and, and approaches. Uh, but there are others as well, inductive inference, statistical physics, and traditional statistical analysis. So each theory is attempting to sort of simplify the problem by making assumptions or, you know, glossing over detail in, of a particular phenomenon, in this case of learning, in order that we can then do some analysis and then hopefully make that uh, analysis drive algorithms that will optimize the performance. And of course, the quality of the theory uh, 
you know, each theory has strengths and weaknesses, uh, the better it captures the details of the uh, real world problem, uh, the better the theory uh, and the better the chances of it uh, making uh, good algorithms or good predictions in this case, so driving good algorithms. Um, and, you know, it's not a finished process. It's, it's always uh, something that needs, as I mentioned, you know, at the beginning, for example, trying to analyze the performance of transformers is something that's very far from uh, understood, I believe. So, um, so they begin with an assumption, uh, and in our case, in statistical learning theory, we begin with the assumption that the data is generated by an underlying distribution, okay? Um, but uh, typically, that is not known to the user, to the learner. So it, we think about the data as, in some way, a distribution that is generated from the real world, that is generating our input set, and also generating our test set. And it's that distribution uh, or assumption about the unif unity of that distribution that enables us to say something about how our training set performance should transfer to the test set. Um, and that's, you know, the, the basis of that assumption. But we try to make it as general as possible by making no specific assumptions about that distribution. So we're not assuming it's a Gaussian or it's a this or that type of distribution, just that it is, there is a distribution. So if we think about, you know, that in the case of, say, we have, uh, we, perhaps we had a problem of trying to distinguish between images of cancerous cells and images of uh, healthy cells. Um, if we were, you know, as a distribution generating those, those images, uh, that distribution, you can probably imagine, is pretty complex. I mean, the whole of biology is in there. Uh, the whole of the, you know, the way in which the cell may have uh, mutated in order to cause it to become cancerous, how that influences the development of the different tissue and RNA and all of the rest of it, the genetic transcriptions, what is happening in that cell. You know, hey, I don't want to go there. Anyway, it, it's very, very complex. Uh, and what we're hoping is that nonetheless, by extracting features from those images, we will be able to understand that uh, to the extent that we can discriminate between those images that represent cancerous cells and those that represent healthy cells. Um, and we'd like to be able to analyze that. So we want to be able to analyze that performance without necessarily understanding the processes that generated that data. So this is why the assumption has to be very uh, unrestrictive in the f form of the uh, distributions that we think may be generating the data. So the critical thing that, uh, so it sub subsumes, if you like, this distribution subsumes the processes of the natural or artificial world that we're studying. And we access that distribution indirectly through the training data. And our assumption is that the training data is generated IID and that means independently and identically from that distribution. Uh, now that's also, you know, a big assumption and breaks down in many cases, but it's not a totally unreasonable assumption. Uh, now the reasons it could break down, there may be some sequentiality in the data. If you're thinking about, you know, a time series, of course that breaks down because the time observation at time t plus one is likely to be in some way correlated with the time observation at time t or, or some partial correlation. Um, so in that case, you might need to, you know, read off observations at certain intervals where you could assume that that influence has decayed in order to get independent or partially independent examples. Um, another reason is that there may be the data was collected in one environment and perhaps your test is in a new environment. Uh, that is slightly different. It's the same problem, but perhaps, you know, you're in a different country, you're in a different hospital, you're in a different environment. The conditions change slightly. And this is known as domain shift. Uh, and again, is not covered in this version of statistical learning theory that I'm, I'm, I'm going to present or that we're going to think about today. But, but again, has, you know, there are people attempting to make that uh, rigorous in those 
shift, or you know, many results in that area as well. Um, but this is the, the assumption for this purposes of this talk will be that it's exactly the same distribution and that the examples are completely independently generated from that distribution. Um, and what we want to do is place guarantees on the performance of the learned algorithm on unseen data from this same distribution. Okay, so let's say we have an algorithm. I'll call it A. Um, and we have a set of functions that we're going to uh, use the, uh, to um, choose from. The algorithm will choose from this set F. And we have a training set S. So we can think of the algorithm as taking input S and outputting a function that is drawn from that uh, class F. Um, so, you know, if we were thinking in terms of the ridge regression, the algorithm would be, you know, ridge regression with some fixed regularization parameter, for example, and the F might be defined by choosing the kernel that would then define the function space that you were choosing from. Okay, and then now the important point I wanted to bring out here is that the S is actually a random variable now because remember we're assuming S is generated from the training data IID. Sorry, from the, 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 the input distribution IID. So imagine you know, that is generated uh, each time we run the algorithm. It's a different training set. It's generated IID from the distribution that is generating the data. Obviously, this may not be possible in the real world because you might not be able to access that, but this is the theoretical frame we're thinking of. Um, so in that sense, the performance now of the algorithm is the measurement of the loss, which I'm demoting by this sort of curly L here, uh, between the uh, application of this function that we learned from S to a test input X and its comparison with the loss function to the uh, actual required output Y. Uh, so it's a discrepancy between those two and it's the expectation of that discrepancy uh, when the test point is drawn according to that same distribution. So it's the expectation of this discrepancy um, that we're measuring but this is a random variable because it depends on the generated training set. So what I want to think, I'm going to think about now is that distribution of performance we might expect to see as we generate different training sets. Slightly complicated, but um, of course the loss function in the case of classification would be just a simple binary, you know, did you get it right, did you not? So uh, loss of one if you if you disagree and zero otherwise, but in regression we had the squared loss which we used in the ridge regression case, but it could be other losses as well. Um, so I'm going to refer to this random variable epsilon uh, as the generalization of the learner, um, and uh, we want to think of it as, uh, well, in, in, in practical terms we're going to have to estimate this performance. So we're going to estimate it by a proxy. Okay, it's the expectation, remember, uh, on a randomly drawn test point. But of course, if we have a holdout set, we get a kind of unbiased estimate of that from the holdout set. So we're thinking of using that um, uh, or validation set, which is a subset of the training samples that are not used in the training algorithm. Um, of course, if they're used, then it's no longer unbiased. Uh, so they're held out or, n or validated in the sense that they're not used in the training. So this gives an unbiased, and in practice, you can also do things like cross-validation, which are much harder to analyze, and uh, it's not quite clear what you're doing, but to some extent they work. Um, so I'm just going to give an example. Um, this is the breast cancer data set from the UCI repository, very simple example. Um, I'm going to imagine using a very simple algorithm, which is just so-called parsing window classifier, um, which is where you take a weight vector, which is the average of the positive examples in your training set minus the average of the negative training set examples. So it's sort of, you know, here's my cluster of positives, here's my cluster of negatives, just draw a vector between the two centers of mass of those two clusters and split the difference between them. 
and that's my classifier. So it's the simplest possible thing you could probably do. Um, and uh, so it's not a very good algorithm, um, but I'm going to see what this distribution of training set uh, performances is um, when I repeatedly generate training examples. Now, the way I'm going to repeatedly generate training examples, obviously, I've got a fixed data set. So I'm going to imagine I'm using maybe half of the data set or, or some size of data set and randomly selecting examples from that fixed set. Um, and then use the ones I didn't select as my test set uh, in which I'm going to evaluate my performance. So I'm going to do this, you know, 10,000 times, and each time I'm going to get a different test error, and then I'm going to plot a histogram of the uh, performance or distribution of the performances I observe with different uh, training set sizes, and I'm going to start with um, half the training set and then a, a third and so on down to very small training sets in, in, this, uh, in this example and that you're going to see how the distribution kind of evolves uh, um, and just to say that the expected classifier is the same in all cases and this is just a simple observation that the expected value of this classifier uh, is the expected value of the average of the positives minus the average of the negatives and, of course, that's just the expected value of the positive minus the expected value of the negative uh, examples. Um, so we shouldn't, in average, expect to see a big difference between the, uh, these, these functions. But, of course, the nonlinearity and the loss function means they won't be the same. So this is just the performance, actually, on the whole training set. So we just, if we just, this is test set performance, uh, sorry, training set performance if we just use the whole set, just to sort of set the kind of target of what we might be able to achieve. Um, so it's about 0.15 error. Uh, so this is now using half the training, remember? So we've used, we, we've got 680 or so examples. We've selected half of them. We've evaluated this, uh, calculated this function by taking the average of the positives, average of the negatives, splitting the difference in the vector, evaluated that on the points we didn't select, and record that value, and now this is the distribution of those values when we repeatedly do this. Okay, so this is the, uh, we, we get an average, which is very close to what we saw on the whole training set of 0.15. Uh, we can sometimes do as bad as, uh, sorry, as well as 0.1, In this is the, uh, the uh, test error here that I'm, I'm uh, on the x-axis, and this is the frequency in which we observe that test error. Um, so the most frequent, of course, is this uh, is very close to this average, and the um, the worst case performance is around 0.2. So we can do as bad as 0.2 if we're unlucky with the training set. Okay, in this case, and now I'm going to shrink the size of the training set. Uh, things are going to get harder for the algorithm, um, and but things don't change that much. The average is is identical. We're starting to see a little kind of blip here uh, around the, the poor performance, around 0.2. Um, I'm now going to shrink further, and you can see the, uh, the distribution slightly shifted to the, to the right, but the mean is very still very uh, close to 0.15, but we're starting to see performance drift uh, beyond 0.2 uh, sometimes when you're unlucky. Um, and this gets worse as we go smaller. Again, the average is still about 0.15, but we're starting to get quite a nice little hump here around 0.2. Um, and then things start to deteriorate a little bit more. Um, the average has got a little worse, but hardly any, 0.16 maybe. Uh, but we're getting significant number of occasions when our performance is really quite bad, uh, and certainly you know, significantly bigger than 0.2. Uh, and so on. Things start to really deteriorate. Um, but again, I think it's important to see how this tail of this distribution is really causing us a lot of grief. Um, and uh, this is down to size 27. But the average is still, you know, not that bad. It's 0.18 compared to 0.15. Okay, it's worse, but not really significantly worse. But, you know, we're actually seeing performances that are, you know, really very poor. Uh, occasionally. 
Um, and then, you know, I, I have just flipped through the last one so you get really poor performance. Okay. This example is really trying to highlight the difference between expected results versus high competence results. Um, the point is that when we actually get a training set, we don't have the luxury of saying, I don't like that training set. It's out here in the distribution. Um, uh, give me another one. You, know, I, I, you don't have that. We get a training set, and that's what we have to work with. So we could be anywhere in this distribution. Um, and so our performance, we might say on average is not too bad, but actually it could be terrible. And we want to try to avoid that situation. Okay, um, and so uh, what we would like to have is an algorithm that is much more careful about the tail of the distribution. We'd like to be able to optimize the tail of the distribution. That algorithm was clearly had a very bad tail. Sorry, I'm showing it the wrong way. You know what I mean, and this way. Um, and so that is not going to be good. On many occasions, we're going to end up with some pretty poor performance. Um, and so I think it's fair to say that traditional statistics has tended to be more interested in the mean of the distribution and the limit of that as the training set size goes to uh, infinity. Um, but that quantity, I think you'd agree, can be misleading, um, uh, even for low-fold cross-validation. Um, so statistical learning theory has tried to focus on this idea of the tail of the distribution and trying to bound that tail or optimize the bound on the tail of that distribution. Uh, what I mean by that is some high percentile, like 95th percentile of that distribution, optimize your algorithm to bring that 95th percentile as low as possible. Uh, so it looks a bit like a statistical test. So you say in a statistical test, you say significant at the 1% confidence means that the chances of that conclusion being wrong uh, are less than 1% over randomly generated training sets. So what we will be doing is trying to say the chances of our training set ending up uh, with a poor performance or performance beyond this bound that we're going to give is 1%. You know, that's the probability we're in the tail of the distribution of performances that uh, we would expect to see from this algorithm. Uh, and so we're very confident that we're going to do better than this particular value that we're, uh, the, the algorithm is optimizing. It's also led to an acronym, which isn't a very uh, confidence-inspiring acronym, known as PAC, which is probably approximately correct. Um, <laughs> But what it means is that probably is this confidence. You know, there's probably uh, is the chances if you're not being in that tail of the distribution. Okay, so there's a high probability, we should be saying it should be high pack or high probability of approximately correct. And approximately correct means that we've got this bound on performance that we're going to uh, be able to see on the test set. Okay. Okay. So, Fast forward, um, there is a, a theory developed. There are actually a few different theories. But, um, the initial theory was based on um, uh, using uh, what are called covering numbers uh, and was quite uh, convoluted in the way it worked. Randomacher theory was actually, I think, a, a significant simplification and also uh, tightening of the bounds. Um, there is a further theory now developed called the Pack Bayes model of uh, analysis that I'm not going to talk about, but delivers even tighter bounds. But uh, it is quite confusing to present because it kind of mixes Bayesian and a statistical learning theory, and uh, so can be. Uh, you know, there are several distributions floating around. So I, I, I you know, prefer not to go into it as a sort of separate topic in a way. But it does, uh, but I think the Radamacher gives a very kind of intuitive picture of what's going on, okay? So I think it's a nice way of thinking about it. So it is a theory that applies to uh, a quite general situation. You have a function class F, you have this IID assumption, M examples drawn, and a function 
f, which is going to be your measurement of performance here. So think of this as your loss function or loss class. And so the, this is your thing you're interested in, your expected loss performance on a test example. Uh, so this is you know, your misclassification error, if it was classification, or your expected squared difference between the output of the function and the, uh, the correct value in your regression case, etc. So think of this as in classification as just your probability of misclassifying uh, a test point. And you're bounding it by this e hat, which um, is my notation for the empirical performance. So this is how good I do on the test set, on the training set, sorry. Uh, so I'm able to bound the performance on the test set by my performance on the training set plus two extra factors. One is involving this confidence parameter, delta, which is the probability that I'm going to be misled by my training set. So this was my tail measure. You know, this is my percentile that I'm going to kind of neglect of my distribution where I say, okay, I, I may be just so unlucky. Uh, but the interesting thing is it comes under a log of one over delta. So this is very, uh, you know, benign in terms of its influence on the bound divided by the number of training examples. So this is the, let's say, the cost of the confidence. Um, and we can, you know, double the confidence with very little extra cost. And then there is this thing known as the Radamacher complexity of the function class. Now remember, this function class is now the loss class, but um, we'll, we'll mention that later. But, um, and this is actually known as the empirical Radamacher. Um, that just means that we're evaluating it on the actual training set itself. And what it uh, measures is how well the function class can align with random noise. Okay, so sigma here is uh, a vector of m dimensions, so m examples, we've got m examples, and we're going to generate random labels on those examples, and we're going to ask how well can the function class correlate with that random noise. So clearly, if it can correlate with random noise, then there's a good chance it's going to overfit, right? That's the, the, the intuition here. So by measuring this, we're saying how flexible the function class is and therefore how likely we are to be overfitting on the training data. And this theory uh, makes that very precise. It says, yes, this Radamacher complexity is exactly the quantity you need to add to your, your um, training set error in order to bound your test set error plus this small extra factor, let's say, due to the confidence. Okay, so let's now, how do we apply that to SVMs? It's a little bit convoluted, but I won't spend a lot of time on it. And the first point is, what is the Radabacher complexity of the underlying function class, the, re the linear function class that are defined by uh, a kernel defined in a kernel defined feature space. And um, this can be analyzed uh, surprisingly straightforwardly, uh, and I think it's quite tight, um, but there is some uh, uh, estimation here. Um, basically, you're just taking that expression for the Radamacher complexity. Remember the expectation over these Radamacher, they're called, it's Radamacher complexity because these are called Radamacher variables, these sigmas. They're just random plus minus ones. And uh, you're using the linearity here in the feature space uh, of the function class. Remember the functions are defined by uh, a weight vector. So we can write this function evaluation as an inner product and because we can move the sum into the inner product. We can uh, actually, this is now the soup of the inner product between the weight vector and this uh, fixed sum here. And uh, we know how to optimize an inner product. If we have a weight vector with a restricted norm, we just choose it parallel to the vector we want to optimize the inner product with. And plugging that in, this is what you get. Um, now, in order to evaluate that, we have to make one additional, well, a couple of additional steps, but we just uh, notice that this is the square root of the inner product with itself. The uh, expectation through 
Jensen's inequality, we can move the uh, uh, square root through the inner product and get an upper bound. And now we've got an expectation of this expression. And it's only because these sigmas are independent, all of these are zero apart from the case where i equals j. And when i equals j, you get sigma i squared, which is plus one always, plus one or minus one squared is always one. And so this just becomes the trace of the kernel matrix. Okay. The detail. Um, so really, this is a constant. The only thing that's moving here is the B, which was our bound on the norm of the weight vector. So the Radomacher complexity of this is uh, linearly dependent on the norm of the weight vector um, that we use. And these, and obviously, if this was a normalized kernel, this would just be the square root of m, and this would be 2b over the square root of m. OK, so this is the optimization that we use for the SVM. Um, and uh, I'll come back to tying this more tightly into the bound that I've just shown you. Um, but this is just to set the motivation. Uh, and the idea here is we're trying to optimize uh, the separation of the training data. So here, we're multiplying the uh, output of the, uh, the uh, function, uh, the underlying linear function, which we're going to learn, plus an offset, times the, uh, the label. And so this is going to be positive if it's correctly classified. So remember, this would be um, negative if it was a negative example, or should be negative if it's a negative example, times a negative label becomes positive. You know, positive, it's a positive example, time a positive label, it's positive. And we're going to uh, try to make it bigger than a, not just positive, but bigger than a, a threshold gamma. And this gamma we're going to refer to as the margin. So we're trying to separate with a margin, and we'll see why this is motivated by the, uh, the bound that we're going to get. Uh, but we're going to allow, and we're going to try to minimize, sorry, maximize that margin, minimize minus the margin, uh, plus we're going to allow the possibility that some data points fail to achieve that margin. So that might, they might still be correctly classified, but just miss the margin, or they might even be uh, misclassified if that psi was bigger than gamma. Okay? And we're going to try to do that with a bound on the norm of the weight vector, because we saw that norm of the weight vector entering into the uh, cost of our um, uh, Radomacher complexity. Okay? And psi, we, we can write in this way um, because of the, uh, uh, the, the way in which we're just turning this around. Okay. So the intuition is that maximizing the margin makes it possible to obtain good generalization despite the high VC dimension. Now, I haven't mentioned VC dimension. That refers to the vapnik chervenenkis dimension. Um, uh, and the vapnik chervenenkis dimension of linear functions is equal to the dimension of the space plus one. And there are bounds that sh lower bounds on the generalization based on the VC dimension that say that there exist distributions that can force high test error if you have uh, uh, training set sizes that are smaller than the VC dimension. So the sort of, it's showing that you need to have at least uh, training set size is equal to the VC dimension um, to learn, apparently. Um, so the lower bound implies that if we're learning in these high dimensional spaces that we're generating with kernels, something must be breaking down in terms of the VC bound. Um, and the, the critical point is that in that lower bound, it says there exist distributions that force high error. So what actually the SVM must be doing is exploiting benign distributions. There must be something about the distributions that is enabling it to learn. And this is, I think, a really critical insight in terms of understanding machine learning. Machine learning is not just learning the function. It's also learning something about the distribution of the data that is actually enabling it to do such a good job of learning. So the lower bound would tell us, no, no, you couldn't possibly learn in this space. But we learn nonetheless 
because we're understanding there is something about this distribution that is particularly amenable to learn, make learning possible. And the, the, the property that we're looking for is this margin. The margin is somehow a natural separation that is present in the distribution between the positive and negative examples. So if you think about, you know, I don't know, trying to recognize digits, digits have been designed um, whenever they were designed to make it easy to recognize that there's a clear separation between a two and a three and that those separations are there inherently in the data set that we're seeing and therefore uh, the algorithms are able to find those separations even in these very high dimensional feature spaces. So um, that is I think a critical insight that is also present in deep learning and that's, but I think we understand it less there because there's so much uh, mm, structure in the deep networks that is somehow able to capture structure in the inputs distribution uh, that is enabling such good performance. Uh, and I, again, I think this is something that requires further uh, analysis and understanding. So the margin in this, in this simple case of support vector machines, the margin is this indicator that the, dis the distribution uh, is actually uh, good and we're actually going to do a good job in learning. Um, and so this is the, 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 the property of the margin that I'm, is just the label times the output of the linear function, um, the underlying linear function, um, and it's positive if correctly rationalized, and it measures the distance from the separating hyperplane. Uh, and the margin of the classifiers is the minimum of that value. But as I said, we do allow margin errors. Uh, so that's, so this is just the simple picture of a way, you know, in this case, positives, negatives, and we're finding the hyperplane that in some sense creates the largest, you know, hi highway between the two. Um, of course, I, here I've assumed there are no uh, non-zero slack variables, but in, in practice there might be. I'll show examples later where there are some points that are uh, either within the margin or uh, misclassified. So this is the hyperplane separating, and this is plus the margin minus the margin. These are the two points that are defining, if you like, or three points here that define the optimal hyperplane in this case. Um, so the support vector machine seeks the linear function, potentially in this kernel-defined feature space that optimizes the bound on generalization. And the bound on generalization is this probability of misclassification. Um, and this is, can be written as the expectation of this function here, which is now uh, look, starting to look a bit like the margin. And if we then use uh, this loss function, which is uh, basically just converting that discrete jump of misclassification into a, uh, a linear misclassification, uh, which starts at zero if you're outside the margin and then goes linearly up through one uh, to one at the point of misclassification and then, sorry, uh, through that linear bit here and then stays uh, at one once you're misclassified. So it's slightly upper bounds the actual cost because it counts a cost in the um, region between the margin and the misclassification. Uh, we can upper bound this misclassification by this quantity and then apply the Radamacher complexity bound, get an empirical version of that plus the Radamacher uh, complexity, plus this uh, extra term. These are just going to be those slack variables. This is just the cost of being inside that margin uh, or upper bounded by the slack variables. And this we're going to bound with that technique that I uh, described before for the uh, kernel-defined feature space. Um, and so plugging that in, we get a bound on the performance of the support vector machine in terms of these slack variables divided by gamma. There's one extra component here we have to take into account the loss function and that, that comes through the slope. Uh, so we get a two on gamma uh, factor multiplying the basic Radomacher complexity that I showed you of the, um, the linear function class itself. So th that gives us the overall bound uh, on performance. 
And the optimization I wrote down is clearly optimizing the sum of these psi i's and uh, maximizing this gamma, and hence m minimizing this, this bound on performance. Um, where I've substituted in the, uh, obviously, the uh, expression I had in terms of the trace of the kernel matrix. And if we have the Gaussian kernel, which is normalized, we actually get this expression here, which is even simpler. Okay, so that gives you the optimization bound. And here it is again, just to remind us. So you're maximizing the margin together with a trade-off of these slack variables. And uh, there's a constant here that uh, determines that trade-off a bit like a regularization parameter. And the optimization will minimize the probability of error for an appropriate choice of C. So you may have to vary C to see which combination of weighting gives you the best uh, bound performance. OK, so we can think of the SVM now as motivated by that theory, um, that statistical learning theory. And remember, what it's really trying to do is, with high confidence, bound that tail, uh, the, the sort of worst performance we might expect on an average training set. Um, and let's just see how it does. Let's see how it does. Let's proof of the pudding in the eating. OK, so this is our uh, error distribution now, uh, comparing the SVM with the uh, previous you know, pars and window estimator that I described. Um, uh, but I'm not using a kernel here. I mean, I'm using the linear kernel, right? Because that means that I'm actually using the same, I'm, I'm in the same um, uh, function space. So the functions I can represent with the support vector machine are identical to the functions that could be represented with the pars and window estimator. So I'm not giving it any advantage or disadvantage in terms of the complexity of function. All I'm doing is choosing a different optimization, and I'm now looking at the plot of error performances that I get when I now generate lots and lots of random training examples, training, uh, training sets, sorry. Um, and clearly, the you know, the performance is actually a mean, not much better, but I'm getting rid of this tail of the distribution, exactly, you know, what it said on the tip, right? I'm, I'm trying to in, ensure I don't see that bad performance uh, when I use that, uh, that sort of theoretically motivated approach. And if I reduce the training set size, still the same thing, I'm able to cut out that tail of that distribution um, and, you know, be sure or with high confidence sure that I'm actually going to get good performance whatever training data you throw at me or roughly whatever, you know, with, with high probability I won't see those poor performances. Uh, and again, you know, you can see that tail cut off in this smaller training set size. Uh, after this, things start to deteriorate, but, I mean, still we're seeing a lot of uh, improvement over the pass and window in terms of worst case performance, uh, although obviously, you know, with these training set sizes, things are not easy to learn. Um, but uh, I think, you know, you can actually see the evidence that this is definitely, well, maybe not in this case, but in most cases, it's actually working quite well. Okay, so that motivates, let's, okay, this is all in the input space. Let's try and move to the, uh, the uh, kernel version. How are we going to do that? Well, which is called the dual space, kind of sounds like we need to do the dual of the optimization problem, and that's exactly what we need to do. So we need to convert this to the dual optimization problem. Um, and the way we do that is uh, by introducing so-called Lagrange multipliers for the uh, constraints. Uh, so we need a Lagrange multiplier for each of these constraints, um, and one for each of these constraints, and one for this constraint here. Um, and uh, so we, call, we form what's called the Lagrangian, which is the basic optimization minus, in this case, the sum of the Lagrange multipliers times the constraints, um, where we've brought the right-hand side uh, over to the left, so it's greater than or equal to naught. Um, here's the other constraints and the third uh, constraint, all introduced. And there's constraints on these alphas now to be uh, these uh, Lagrange multipliers to be greater than or equal to zero uh, in, in this case. 
We then take the derivative of this expression with respect to the primal variables and set it equal to zero. Uh, and so the primal variables are the weight vector, the size, the B, and the gamma. Um, and we get this set of equations. And we substitute back into that Lagrangian in order to remove the primal variables and end up with an optimization only involving the dual variables. And this is what we arrive at. And we can actually optimize away the lambda. Uh, and we end up with this form. So this is the dual optimization that we actually solve. And magically, we have ended up with an optimization that only involves inner products between uh, training points. And so we can substitute in, as before, our kernel function. And we can solve this support vector optimization in a kernel-defined feature space without actually explicitly computing in that space. So we have this you know, high dimensional space, maybe even infinite dimensional potentially, um, and we will be able to solve this optimization and find this optimizing hyperplane in that space by solving this optimization. And the alphas are going to have exactly the same role as we had in the bridge regression. They're going to be the way in which we reconstruct the weight vector uh, from the uh, training examples. Um, I'll skip that because I think we're running a little short of time. Just to mention, there are so-called Kuhn-Tucker conditions, which are the fact that the Lagrange multiplier times the constraint are going to be equal to zero. The reason for this is the Lagrange multipliers are only kicked in if the optimization has to kind of push the solution to satisfy the constraint. So the alpha here in this case is saying, OK, you're not quite satisfying my margin constraint, so I'm going to kick in a bit of alpha to push you to satisfy that constraint. If I don't need to, alpha will be 0. OK, so that's the way that works. Um, and so alpha i is only not equal to 0 if uh, this constraint is uh, active. And so that will mean that they correspond to so-called support vectors. And so nicely, we're saying, actually, our solution is a linear combination. Our weight vector solution is a linear combination of a subset only of the training examples, those that sit on the margin or inside the margin. So all of the points that are nicely, happily classified sitting out there uh, without uh, hitting the margin don't appear in the expression for the weight vector. So when we're evaluating a test point, we only need to compute the inner product with the points that are support vectors. Um, and uh, there's also here a point that psi i will only be not equal to 0 if alpha i is actually at full uh, its maximal value. If it, uh, alpha i, sorry, was uh, bounded between 0 and c. c was that trade-off parameter between the psi and, and the weight vector. So it'll only be, uh, psi I will only, so the sort of, you can imagine as the point hits the margin, alpha I starts to ramp up and it tries to keep it there and then it reaches its maximum value and then okay, I'm gonna have psi I kick in and be non-zero. So that's sort of, if you think of it as a dynamic, that's the way it, it works. Um, and uh, you can compute, picking particular values, what the threshold is and what the actual function is that you're uh, evaluating and what the various margin and so on parameters are. I won't go into these, but they can easily be computed. Um, there's a nice connection here with so-called new support vector machine uh, with this version of the SVM because if we write uh, C as one on uh, one divided by new times n, so think of new as a fraction of the, you know, so maybe 0.1 would mean uh, you're dividing by 0.1m means you're saying 10% of the training examples. Um, and what you can show is that if you have uh, new, uh, you can bound the number of points for which psi i is greater than zero must be at most new m. So if I pick new equal 0.1, only 0.1 points can be inside the margin. Um, uh, and equally, uh, at least new m points have alpha i not equal to zero. So in some way, it's sort of controlling the number of 
support vectors, which is quite a nice way of thinking about setting the regularization. Um, of course, if mu is uh, too small, then uh, you may actually end up with a trivial solution. It won't, it won't work, essentially. Uh, so you have to pick mu big enough, but then you pick it in a way that uh, will work. So nu can be seen as setting a fraction of the support vectors, which is a natural measure, perhaps, of complexity that you might want to use. Um, but those uh, implies more efficient evaluation on a test point because the kernel on the test point only needs to require those inner parts. Just to say, the more traditional way of uh, solving an SVM is, is this optimization, which is slightly different, um, but they lead to equivalent solutions, uh, except the values of C you know, don't correspond. Um, so I'll skip that. Oh, just to mention that in this case, uh, if you use this alternative and use a, a zero threshold, which you can do, uh, which gets rid of this constraint, then you, there's a very nice simple algorithm called the kernel adatron, which allows you to do kind of point gradient descent on the alpha i's independently. So you can actually just update individual alpha i's, and that's a, a quite efficient algorithm if you choose them in a sensible way. The so-called SMO algorithm solves for the uh, case where this constraint still holds and has to update pairs of alpha i's, uh, alpha i, alpha j. Okay, so finally, we've now got a situation where we can solve an SVM in this high dimensional space. Let's imagine we jump to infinite dimensions, which the Gaussian kernel corresponds to infinite dimensional space because it's an infinite dimensional polynomial. And remember, each term in the polynomial is adding you know, larger and larger feature, feature vectors. Um, so uh, this is working in a potentially infinitely dimensional space um, but uh, this is the solution that we might get in, in a simple two-dimensional example. Notice that there are, these are the margins now. This is the separating hyperplane in the, in the feature space, but mapped back into the input space. Uh, this is the margin in the feature space mapped back into the input space, and this is the other margin. So these are the negative points. These are the support vectors here, 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 and here, and these ones that are on the margin. But these are also uh, margin, you know, these breach the margin, so they will also be support vectors. And this one's even, mis these two are even misclassified. But these are margin errors that are actually still correctly classified on the negative side. Uh, so it just gives you a, a sort of picture of how this looks in the input space. Um, uh, but what we can also do the same as we did before, that histogram of performances uh, with that breast cancer data, now using our kernel to uh, increase the uh, flexibility of the function space. Let's see if that is going to cause us a problem. Um, so now we have a very, you know, much more flexible function class, but the, you know, theory hopefully will drive a solution that nonetheless performs well and doesn't, uh, and indeed that is the case. So this is now the distribution uh, with the Gaussian kernel. This is the old distribution with the, um, with the Parson window um, for the uh, largest, you know, half the training data. If we go to the 200, there's a third of the training data. Still, we're performing very, very well with the Gaussian kernel. Even at the tail of the distribution, we're outperforming the um, mean of the uh, uh, Parson window estimator. That's it. Okay. Uh, so I think time for a break. I've got one more lecture, I think, to do tomorrow. Um, so I'll be talking about the Bayesian relations and some other more kind of uh, interesting, hopefully, applications then. And uh, thank you.